Good morning. How's everyone out there? Sweet. Well, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to take you on a tour of the OSM visualization and mapping world. Um, hopefully, we're going to show you some things that you haven't seen before. Um, because you may not have seen them before, um, and there's a whole bunch of them, uh, there is a bit.ly link on every other slide. Um, it's the same link. So if you miss it, it's on the next one. Um, and it's a link to a Google spreadsheet um, that lists all of the things that we're showing here. Um, and so you can find out more information about it or check it out and potentially figure out a way to, to rebuild it. Yeah. All right, so uh, with that, we're gonna jump right in. Um, we'll try to be a little bit uh, interactive here. Um, and as we go through these visualizations, if you have questions about interpretation, uh, what they're trying to represent, we're gonna try to describe them and be really clear about it. Um, but please do uh, feel free to ask questions along the way and not just save them for the end and we can kind of uh, go through it that way, so. So as with, with many things, we're gonna start with the beginning. Um, I don't know how to, how do you go next? There we go. So this is one of the first OSM visualizations out there. It's from 2005. Um, it's by uh, Tom Carden, who is at University College London. And what they did is they got two weeks of e-courier data and uh, this was GPS traces, and so you can see where the couriers were going around. Uh, and this was actually the first data import into OSM. Uh, this was used to do some of the preliminary mapping of central London. And what we kind of take out of this is that OSM is about data. Um, it's about finding all of the data that you have available to you, whether it's people on bikes, whether it's you on bikes, whether it's just going out and and looking for individual points of interest and getting it out. But it's but it's about data. Great. And um it's it's really, really, really about data. Um this is a map of OSM density. Uh this is a snapshot from 2019. Uh so brighter areas are places that have that are much more densely mapped. Uh, and there's an interactive link uh, to this where you can actually look at the variable densities uh, by year going back to 2014, which is pretty interesting. So you can see how the map has evolved over time. Uh, we're gonna show some stuff a little bit further on um, where we're gonna show how the map has actually changed in the last five years. Um, and then, so that's pure density. Um, it gets a little bit more interesting when you start to break it up uh, according to what's actually in there. Uh, this is a map of man-made features versus natural features. Uh, so what we did, or what, what Jennings did here, is he took the uh, anything that is tagged with natural equals anything and colored that blue, is that correct? Yeah. Um, and then everything else uh, shows up in the other color. So you can find out, okay, what is where are the natural features, where are the unnatural features, um, man-made stuff. I have a, a quick trivia question. Um, everyone see the, the rectangles up there in the, the northwest? Um, anyone know what those are? Close, but no. <laughs> yeah. Nope. That's good though. Yeah. That's actually probably the closest one yet. Um, yeah, let's, let's, yeah. Yeah, uh, nuclear uh, waste sites. Yeah, so if you didn't think that OSM had everything in it, it does. <laughs> I really thought it was an error at first, um, but yeah, no, they're, they're there, you can, you can find them. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk to Yeah, so, um, so this is another fun one. This is, uh, the resolution here is Z12 um, tiles. And what I'm doing is just counting the number of features in each tile, um, and then putting it on this map here with this kind of log color scale. And at first it kind of says, hey, the world is somewhat mapped. Um, and yes, this is true for like yellow and green areas, um, but more of these kind of uh, purple and blue areas, uh, what we're looking at here are where there's only kind of zero to 100 features in a Z12, an entire Z12, uh, Zoom 12 uh, tile. Um, and so this is kind of saying, we know something's there, but it's not yet completely mapped. Uh, so you can kind of look at this like a divergent color scheme uh, there from, from the middle um, of where things are potentially completely mapped um, and where we know there is stuff, um, but it isn't necessarily uh, fully mapped yet. So 
that's, that's about the data. Uh, that's about um, the features in the map. Now we're going to kind of shift into uh, OSM is about the people who are making the data. Um, this is a, another rendering also of density of objects, but only the areas where less than or equal to 10 mappers have uh, been working since 2018. Um, and so for quick comparison to make this make sense, here's, this is exclusive. None of these tiles are on the previous slide. This is where there's more than 10 mappers active. And this one really shouldn't surprise us too much. This is kind of what we would, um, we'd think to, to see. Um, but if we go back to this, uh, the takeaway here is that we have these areas that aren't very dense, but there are people mapping there and working. Um, and so kind of I think the big takeaway here is like, we are filling in the world slowly, unequally, but people are working everywhere and, um, and it's happening. Um, and in it being about the people, it's not just about the mappers and about the data that's in the map, it's actually about the people that it ends up impacting. Uh, so this is one of kind of the seminal events in OSM history. Uh, this was the earthquake in Haiti uh, and what happened to the map during that process and what it ended up meaning for the people who were affected by the earthquake. Uh, so the screenshot on the bottom is uh, just before, it's is as the earthquake happened, what uh, Port-au-Prince looked like uh, within OSM. And the picture on the top is five days later. So it's it's seeing the OSM community mobilize and map a region. Uh, and then the, the piece that's not really told as part of this story, but it's, it's certainly there, uh, is how that mapping data got handed out to all of the people who were working on the ground, all the first responders uh, and all the people that were working to uh, provide aid uh, in the days after. Um, and this, it, it kind of sets the, the stage for um, how to mobilize a community of mappers uh, in a remote way um, and uh, make uh, focused headway in particular parts of the map. Um, so this is going back to the, the node density map we were showing before. Um, this is what the, the map looked like um, before the Nepal earthquake hit in 2015. 2015. Um, and it had been mapped somewhat. Um, so in the days after the Nepal earthquake, um, I remember going to one of the mapathons in Seattle at the time. Uh, there were mapathons like this happening all over the world, and this happened. Um, all of the people out there were mobilized. All of you created tons of map data that uh, made Nepal just light up on the map and provided, again, lots of really useful information for uh, disaster surveys and for uh, giving people the ability to reach these rural regions that had been affected by the earthquake. Um, and there was another earthquake uh, a couple of years later in Nepal. Um, and in just in general, this, this type of activity has been continuing. So this is a snapshot from 2019. Um, so we can see that the types of mapping that were occurring uh, after the initial earthquake uh, have been continuing. There are also some interesting patterns that show up uh, in the southeast here. Uh, you can see uh, kind of like rough borders around things. And that's actually an artifact of uh, the way that the tasking manager squares are produced. Um, so you can see that these are uh, concerted efforts to do uh, organized mapping um, in areas and really increase the, the quality of the map and the density of the features within it. So um, yeah, so driving a lot of the humanitarian uh, mapping in OSM is the humanitarian open street map team. And what I've done here is count, uh, this is based on change set comments. Um, so I've taken the, the sum of the number of changes per change set um, for all change sets there in blue. And then I've subtracted out the change sets uh, with hot OSM in the comment here in orange. And it's pretty staggering uh, since 2012. Um, HOT is responsible for a lot of the data that's going into OSM. Um, now, these are kind of interesting uh, figures because this is about counting the data and the number of edits. Um, this doesn't necessarily describe the size of communities. I think that's a very much more uh, difficult thing to define. Um, you know, just because someone has one change set with a hot OSM comment uh, doesn't necessarily make them exclusively um, a hot mapper. Um, and so I think there's some fun things to explore here of um, how people are between communities, the multiple communities within OSM. Um, 
but we can see that OSM is kind of, we have this positive trend line, um, but it also is uh, uh, increasing faster is the total number of edits, uh, including the hot OSM uh, edits, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, mostly this is map changes per day, and like we're, we're in the millions uh, daily changes, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting. Um, I think it also talks to the uh, the prevalence of organized mapping. Um, so being able to, so this is necessarily a humanitarian specific thing, but being able to break uh, mapping efforts up into individual campaigns uh, where people can then focus on a particular area, uh, that's that's kind of, that's where the edits without auto SM in the comment comes in. That's something that gets automatically added uh, when you use the tasking manager to do this, as most of you probably already know. Um, but yeah, so um, it's it's not just hot, it's potentially also uh, other tasking managers, OpenStreetMap US operates one. Um, I mean, not counted in this data, but just in terms of the uh, the, the structural uh, patterns of, of editing that are occurring within the map. Um, so also speaking of the uh, hot tasking manager, um, this is, uh, I think that this is a particularly uh, visually striking visualization. Um, and it, fo it shows a few different things. Um, on the y-axis are the um, hot tasking manager projects by ID. So they're uh, approximately, you can kind of correlate them to time. Um, and you can see that those are actually produced on a fairly linear basis. Um, and uh, the uh, x-axis has the starting point um, when those uh, when those uh, tasks were were begun. Um, and then you can see the mapping behavior along along those, uh, and it shows up as little spikes where people have been doing lots of mapping. So the uh, the particularly striking pieces in there are I, I'm assuming that. The, the Nepal earthquake, things around that. Um, it's also interesting to look at this, that there are some others that are a little bit higher. Um, I think it's Map Lesotho. Um, it's a very long running campaign where uh, there are tasks, or sorry, it's a single task that keeps having things added to it. So it's, it's very active so that if people are interested in mapping that area, uh, there are usually new pieces of it that are available to be mapped. Okay, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, this is from a paper from 2018, the life cycle of contributors uh, and collaborative online communities, uh, looking specifically at, at OSM. Um, this is a little bit hard to wrap, uh, wrap your head around, um, but what we have on the x-axis here is the date of someone's first edit, and then the y-axis is the date of their last edit, um, or their kind of most recent edit when you take, when you take the snapshot of the data. Um, and so, uh, you end up with all of the users are gonna be up in the upper upper left-hand side above the diagonal here, and then what you're doing is each dot represents one user, um, and then where, there's, where it's darker, there's more users that are, that are fitting there. Um, so uh, this study, then they went ahead and highlighted um, a couple kind of key events here. So uh, this A, you kind of see this like vertical line, this means that a lot of contributors kind of made their first edit on that day, and then their last edit is kind of going all the way up. So there's a lot of contributors that started and stayed for a week, stayed for a day, uh, stayed all the, the whole time. Um, and that was when OSM was compared to Wikipedia um, in the uh, German newspaper. Um, uh, a couple other things in there. Uh, so like E, uh, for example, represents um, when the users uh, who didn't accept the license change, um, their edits were no longer included. And so that's kind of where you see that horizontal line representing that a lot of users um, kind of stopped there. So I took this and kind of uh, did it again for new data and then did some more filtering. Um, so who's participated in like an OSM Geo Week mapathon? Cool, okay, you're in here. Um, these are really fun. What you see, these kind of vertical lines uh, in November, since like 2014, uh, these kind of trends, these are users who their first edit is during an OSM Geo Week, and they're continuing to edit the map um, since then. Um, and then you see the lines, the horizontal lines I think are really interesting. These are users whose last edit was during an OSM Geo Week, but not necessarily their first edit. And so they may have joined at some point and then done some mapping and then attended an OSM Geo Week, um, but haven't really come back since then, which I just think that's kind of interesting. And then you always have these clusters uh, kind of at the November, November line where those are users who are showing up to an OSM Geo Week, making changes um, and then not returning. Um, 
So then we can do it for uh, all 1.1 uh, million uh, users who've made a, um, a contribution to OSM. Um, and so there's a couple interesting patterns in here. Um, along the, the diagonal, we see a lot of red, uh, which represents mappers bet with like between five and 10 days or 10 and 20 days of mapping. So these are mappers who are joining and mapping a lot um, over multiple days, like two weeks, um, but then not coming back. Um, and so kind of we see a lot of hot tasks are showing up in there as well. Um, the users that kind of the, the thick uh, purple line across the top, those are gonna be users who have joined over the years and their most recent edit was basically when we pulled the data. Um, and so they're consistently uh, continuing to map. Um, and then kind of all this yellow in there, these are kind of the one-time contributors, um, people who are showing up doing a little bit of mapping and, and not really coming back. And you kind of see some like some trend lines in there, uh, some vertical lines representing when a lot of users started. Those do correspond to um, to, to to events, and it's kind of fun to go back and and look at that. Um, probably wondering what the the what happens there in April 2016, that top uh, corner triangle. Um, what I am pretty sure that is is when Maps.me, uh, the mobile app, introduced the in-app editor. And there's a lot of new contributors. Um, what's interesting is it's not necessarily one-time contributors. It kind of fills in. There's a lot of data being generated um, from that. Uh, I think there's a lot of other patterns being hidden in there, and also just a lot more contributors every day. Um, so if anyone has any other ideas about that, um, it'd be fun to dig into that later. Um, but then what you can also see, like when you zoom in on that, this is looking again at April 25th, 2015, uh, the day of the Nepal earthquake there, that black line. Um, and you do see there's kind of a, that vertical trend is uh, that the users towards the top are users who probably started during that earthquake and have continued to map. Um, and then the thick cluster of red in the bottom there are users with um, you know, between 100 and 1,000 change sets um, just in like those two weeks after the earthquake, which is pretty amazing. Um, so one of the other um, one of the other visualizations maps um, that has shown up recently uh, is this cartographers of North Korea. Um, it's a really interesting exploration of uh, who and what uh, who's been mapping North Korea and what's been mapped in North Korea. Um, so yeah, please like check that out. It's it's this great thing. It's it's a really good example of um, how to use maps for storytelling as well. Um, it's one of these scrolly telling where you, you pan down and you get uh, taken to different parts of the map where certain things are are drawn, uh, your attention are drawn to. Um, and then uh, it, it continues on and there's some analysis of what the contributor patterns look like. Um, and then there also have been some, there's been, been analysis, I'm not sure if it's interviews or change set comments, um, but uh, exploring the motivations of why people map. Um, so there's a lot of there, there's a lot of personal experience embedded in this. Um, and I, this is another one where it's it's less data oriented. Um, in terms of um, let's understand when and where uh, people have been contributing, but more about the stories of the people that are within the map and how uh, that ends up affecting um, the people who use the map. Um, yeah, so another example of uh, OSM data in, in publication in, in the press um, is this is one of six maps that was produced for the Washington Post back in 2016. Uh, and we are probably 95% certain that it's actually derived from OSM. It may be from somewhere else. Um, but what they're doing is they're showing infrastructure and using all of the crowdsource data that's been put into OpenStreetMap to uh, help people gain insights um, as they're reading through one of these publications. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, I believe, one of these for railroads. And yeah, this is also a really interesting piece to check out. Yeah, you want to talk about this one? Sure. Uh, has anyone seen these before? These are, yeah, right? Um, <laughs> I like to think of this as like the map of cities I'd like to navigate and the map of cities I wouldn't want to navigate. <laughs> um, <laughs> But this is super cool. Uh, these was these were made with OSM data and processed with with OSM NX, kind of the, the network um, uh, package for uh, manipulating OSM data, and it's showing the directions of uh, cities of, of streets in cities um, in terms of a, a percentage of uh, the total streets in the cities and the directions that they're they're facing. So they're symmetrical along uh, the axis here. Um, 
and you can see that some cities are laid out like north south um and some of the um i don't know if it's there, there's a lot of patterns in here um and I think the more interesting piece, yeah, to kind of compare it is like, if you look at like Manhattan, for example, right? It's not laid out north-south, it's laid out uh, with the direction of the actual, of the actual island. Um, and then Boston, and so a lot of like the older cities as well, um, they end up kind of going every which direction. <laughs> Um, so I, th I think these are really interesting because um, we experience these places that, that we map and that other people map uh, in our daily life. And there may be certain things about them uh, that we experience very viscerally, like the direction of the sun passing through a set, uh, a set of buildings. Uh, and it's really neat to actually see this stuff quantified um, so that this experience where, okay, if you're in Manhattan, when you're there around Manhattan Henge, you're, you're seeing these bright walls of sun. Um, you can see that there's, I mean, there's obviously a reason for it, but... You, other cities have similar patterns uh, according to their orientation. Um, yeah, it's just it's a neat way to to rediscover what's around you um, through potentially data that you've provided yourselves. So, um, yeah, this is this is another one that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, there's a lot of information being expressed here. Um, so on the x-axis, we have a uh, number of nodes created, uh, cumulative uh, in, the, in the planet file. Um, so this is, you know, node version equals one. And on the y-axis, uh, node version equals greater than one. Um, and so nodes that have been modified. And then um, kind of the length of the line between the dots is the amount of data that was either created or modified um, during that time. And so, we see uh, it's kind of interesting. Some of this linear growth. Uh, well, we see first like a, a two to one um, in terms of creation of nodes versus editing, um, just given the the slope. Um, now there could be some misleading stuff in here because this is just nodes, right? And so a building is going to be minimum probably four nodes at least, um, and so that's going to kind of push it into the created uh, side. Um, but I think what's kind of fun here is we see initially like 2007, 2008, we see a lot of nodes created uh, right there, and then immediately a lot of nodes uh, edited. And I think that's Tiger import followed by Tiger cleanup, um, or the beginning of the Tiger cleanup. But I think what's more interesting is like the distance between those two dots representing that time is like all of the data created during the Tiger import. Um, and I would have gotten this trivia question wrong the amount of data created between 2009 and 2010, or 2010, 2011, uh, just in general globally, is actually more, apparently, than um, all of the data imported in the Tiger import. Um, so we do, when we look at the, the map, it's like we see this huge spike with the Tiger import, uh, messes up all of our analysis, but it did create a lot of data, which is great. Um, but this is kind of interesting to know that the rest of the world was also growing at a rate uh, faster um, than, than that. So I think that that's kind of a fun trivia to extract from that. Yeah, seeing, um, as we were going through this, we really want to see the last three, three years of data to see uh, whether or how um, things have exploded uh, and whether we're seeing more. So this was part of Alan's uh, presentation where he talked about map gardening. Um, so the, the premise is that uh, things that are modified are an example of gardening where uh, somebody seeded it with something like the Tiger import or uh, by dropping some buildings in or dropping some road networks in without names uh, and then people go in and revisit it. Um, and it would also be uh, this challenge out to anyone um, to rebuild this this visualization um, not only using nodes um, to see what the, the behavior looks like across um, all element types and then maybe to break it down by uh, road networks. Maybe we've mapped all the roads. Maybe we're continuing to map all the buildings. Maybe we're starting to map all the coffee shops um, or, or getting near the end of that. Uh, speaking of, um, we're, we're going to wrap this up with uh, one final chaser. Um, this is the these are optimal routes by car from the geographic center of the contiguous United States to all counties. Um, so this is cool because it's kind of like, why? 
<laughs> but it's beautiful. Um, and it, it means that the, there's a whole bunch of data that underlies this. Um, we need to have all the, we have to have all the county boundaries to know where the center of them is. We have to have all the road networks uh, to be able to route between them. Um, they need to exist not only within the US. Um, if you look at the, the routes to Northern Maine, those actually go through Ontario. So this is not just a US data set. Um, and it's just, it's, it's kind of interesting because it, it, it shows the richness of everything that's there. And I, I just, I think it's wonderful in that way. Cool. Yeah. Um, so that, that concludes our tour of things. Um, we, I think still have a couple minutes. Um, so questions and also like if, if you want us to talk through any of these and, uh, maybe you can help us come up with some more insights about particular pieces. That'd be awesome. Chad. I think there's lots of ways we can try to do that. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of questions about what are the what's the type of edit, like what's happening, what's the difference between these two versions of the node, um, or more likely the version of the way. Um, yeah, I think that there's um, a lot of current work is trying to look at that, but I don't know that it's quite been quantified because um, it's a big, messy, convoluted data set. Um, yeah, that's kind of a cop-out answer, um, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I think you can. You definitely can. Like, it's in the data. Like, the um, these edits are are, are recorded. Um, everything, like, you know, validation is going to leave a distinct signature in the database, and that's one thing we're trying to do is, like, pull that out and see what we can learn. Um, and yeah, a lot of potential for that, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, so on the wiki it says Zoom 12 is about the area of a small city. Um, now that's gonna change just given the projection that's gonna change uh, based on um, where you are latitude wise. Um, and so, yeah, you caught me. Uh, definitely should have normalized by area on that. Um, but I have those maps normalized by area and they look very much the, exactly the same. Um, uh, yeah, around the equator, it's like 95 square miles, and then it goes down to, I think, like 50, 60 square miles where you still have, or kilometers, sorry, where you still have population. Um, but given where the map is relatively, you know, well mapped or completely mapped, um, and where it's not, the, um, the normalization doesn't make a visual difference um, on that. And so I've, just for sake of computation, haven't been doing that lately, um, but it's a really good point. All right, thank you all. <laughs>